Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Today I want to talk about the phenomenon known as reverse culture shock. And to introduce this, I want to share a driving story. My wife and I were attending a retreat at a Lutheran campground about an hour to two hours outside of Dallas in a pretty part of central Texas. As I was driving down the road, I saw a car coming toward me. But the thing is, the car was in my lane. Thinking to myself, why is there a car driving in my lane? And it took a couple of seconds for it to register that I'm driving on the left side of the road. In order to avoid an accident and be able to tell this story today, I quickly pulled over to the shoulder on the left side of the road. And the guy who was driving, I don't remember if he honked at me. I don't remember anything. I was just in such shock because what had happened is I had interpreted what I saw happening on the American roads through the lenses of driving on African roads. And so with that, I was experiencing reverse culture shock. Reverse culture shock is is this phenomenon that anybody gets when they've lived outside of their home culture for an extended period of time, and then when they return to their home culture, to their country of origin, they find that they don't really fit in like they used to. After my first tour of duty in Bulgaria for two years, when I came back to the United States, I walked into an American supermarket and, again, was just floored uh, by the choices that you had there. See, when I lived in Bulgaria, it was in the years right after communism came to an end, and there were some pretty severe shortages, and the supply chains weren't established very well either. So even if you had the money to purchase these things, you just couldn't find them. And then to be able to walk into a store and and be able to choose from literally 57 varieties of ketchup, it just didn't seem to make any sense. Not everything is that easy to deal with, though, when you're coping with reverse culture shock. I think one of the most uh, painful lessons that I've had to learn over the years is that when I'm back in the United States and people ask me, so what's it like over there? they don't really expect me to give them a long answer. In fact, the shorter the better, because about three seconds after that, they'll ask, oh, what's for lunch today? And I'm not trying to be uh, mean or anything here, but, but truly, to even get to a point where people might be able to, exp- to understand the experiences that you've gone through is just it taxes people's patience it takes just too much explaining because the differences are just too big. Maybe that's part of the problem here. When you're going from one culture to another, when you, especially if you're, if you are the person who has moved around to different places and then you're interacting with somebody who basically has never lived more than an hour away from where they were born, you can come across, you can come off in a very bad way if you're not careful. You know, the people who are the citizen of the world types have a very different way of of viewing uh, reality and and interpreting things in in the news than people who are uh, more provincial or close-minded. And again, I'm not trying to put anybody under the bus or pick on people. It's just the reality is that you, if you haven't had those experiences, you're not going to view things in the same way as others do. How you manage those feelings is really important. How you deal with people who haven't 
had those experiences, it can be very frustrating to you and to them. I can think of another time when I was staying as a guest at my relative's house and a new story came on, a story about something that was happening in another part of the world. And I was familiar with that because, of course, that was big news in the part of the world where I was from, but it wasn't even really registered as much on most people's radar in the United States. My relative's basic ignorance of the situation led me to get quite angry, actually. And I think I made some comment like, oh, just wait till something bad happens in this country, and then people will start asking, well, how did that happen? And of course, that's exactly what happened uh, about a year later when the terrorist attacks of 9-11 came. A big part of reverse culture shock is that you, as an individual, go through some pretty significant changes when you move to another place and you experience another culture. You, you get to not only experience what another people's way of perceiving reality is like, you also get perspective on your own home country. There's nothing like leaving your home country to be able to see it and seeing it from the outside through somebody else's eyes that, that can really help you appreciate uh, not only the weaknesses of your home culture, but some of the things that you can be thankful for as well. But another aspect of reverse culture chakra, I suppose another aspect of moving abroad, is that while you are living outside of your home country, your home country, things are changing as well. We left the United States in 1994 to go to Eastern Europe, and then we came back in 2003, so a period of about nine and a half years. And America didn't sit still during those nine and a half years, as uh, any of you who lived through that decade realize, of course, many significant things happened. And of course, when wherever you live in the world, America news is always uh, reported, so you can kind of have an understanding about uh, things that are happening in the political world. But the cultural references, those are the things that you don't that don't get reported on. So, so when people mention the name Britney Spears in casual conversation. Of course, that's something that they can all connect to. They have a shared experience. The images come to their mind, news stories. But for me, well, there's nothing. It's a black hole. It'd be the same thing as if I were to mention to you the name Slavi Trifonov. So unless you lived in Bulgaria during that time frame of the late 90s and early 2000s, Slavi Trifonov, who's that? Those cultural things, right, it's not that important, obviously, if you don't know what were the top popular songs of the year or uh, what the, the TV show Friends has for its plot line. And yet, when you're coming back to your home country and you're dealing with your fellow Americans and they don't, they're, they're talking about things that you have no idea what they're talking about. It does make you feel like an outsider. It makes you realize that, yeah, I don't belong here like I used to before I left. You realize that to everyone else, they look at you and yeah, you basically look the same. Maybe you put on a few pounds. Maybe you grew some facial hair. Maybe you lost some hair. But more or less, you you look the same to them on the outside. But on the inside, you're not the same person that you were when you left. And only you understand that. I want to spend a little time now talking about the biblical story of the Apostle Paul and his experience with reverse culture shock. I think uh, he understood how difficult it is to go back inside that cultural box once you left it. Now, of course, you know Paul, uh, Jew of Jews, right? Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew all the Jewish cultural references and norms inside and out. He was an expert at uh, picking apart 
the the law and knowing where the boundaries were. But when Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus road, he moved outside of his culture. He not only moved outside of the the Jewish world, but Jesus moved Paul from the world of, of work righteousness, the world of trying to earn your place in heaven. Now, Jesus moved Paul from that world into the kingdom of grace, into a, a place where your position doesn't depend on your performance, where your status isn't dependent on knowing the the rules or the insider code, but instead it's a free gift of God through Christ. I look up to Paul as my role model in being a cross-cultural missionary. One of my favorite passages that he wrote is being of all things to all people. When he was with the Jews, he acted like a Jew. When he was with the Gentiles, he acted like a Gentile. And he didn't let anybody intimidate him. Even when visitors came from the mother church in Jerusalem uh, to check up on those uh, Gentile Christians in Antioch, Paul continued to carry on as he had before to freely associate and eat with his Gentile brothers in Christ. And he even rebuked Peter for his hypocrisy and pulling back from freely associating with the Gentiles. I think that uh, for us living in a secular society like the United States, it's difficult to appreciate how deeply intertwined Jewish culture and religion were, that everything uh, had meaning and significance uh, from the laws concerning when shops could be open to the kind of food that you could eat. Nothing was left to chance. And even those Hellenistic Jews, the Jews who had left the safe confines of Israel and lived abroad amongst the pagan peoples of the Roman Empire, when they came back to Jerusalem, they had to demonstrate that they were Jewish as well. They had to prove that they belonged. In fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, it mentions that a dispute broke out between the the Hellenistic Jews and the other Jews uh, over distribution of food. It seems to me, at least, that maybe part of the problem was that uh, some people felt that they were uh, more, they were getting better treatment than others because of their uh, orthodoxy. So I wonder if perhaps that is why the Apostle Paul decided that he was going to try and get back inside that cultural box one last time, perhaps, to demonstrate to his brothers in the Jewish religion and culture that he too was, was Jewish, that his culture was as Jewish as theirs, and that there was nothing incompatible between being a follower of Christ and a, and a follower of the God of the Old Testament. He got into some pretty big trouble, however, uh, trying to prove his place in his home culture. He shaved his head at a place called Cancria. It was part of a Jewish ritual called the Vow of the Nazarite. You shave off all your hair, and then anything that would grow from your head from that point forward in time would be dedicated to the Lord. You had to complete this ritual at the center of all the Jewish world, in the temple in Jerusalem, a place where only Jews could enter. The Apostle Paul was in Jerusalem with his traveling companions. Some of them were Jewish, some of them were Gentile. And later on that day when Paul entered into the temple to finish his ritual, to prove his loyalty to the Jewish cause, his reputation as a Gentile lover and a Moses hater, triggered a riot. Paul tried to explain himself to his fellow Jews, and he even got through the story of how Jesus had appeared to him on the road to Damascus. But when he mentioned that Jesus sent him to the Gentiles, that's when they flipped out.
Now, you know, the United States is a country that is built on immigrants. Really, all, all of the people except for the Native American population came there from someplace else. And yet it's also true that established immigrant communities conveniently forget the fact that they were themselves at one time immigrants. It's not just Americans who are concerned about an immigrant tidal wave flooding their borders. There are people all over the world who are nervous, if not uptight, about new immigrants coming into their country with very different cultural values than the ones that they have held to traditionally in their country. That's a big part of what Brexit was about. In France, the government has banned Muslim women from wearing headscarves and burkinis on the beach in order to preserve their secular culture. I think a big part of dealing with reverse culture shock and talking to people who haven't had the same experiences that you've had, it gets down to your pride. <laughs> it's the root of so many problems in, in cultural misunderstandings. When I left the United States to go to Bulgaria, I had to keep my mouth shut a lot. It wasn't going to win me any points with anybody by comparing how uh, Americans do things this way, why don't uh, you do it this way, the same way in, in your country? You know, there's just no point in bringing those things up. But I think also the same is true when you return to your country of origin. I found myself clamming up, zipping my lip, not to say too much about the way things are done overseas, because basically I think for some people, talking about these experiences is just going to trigger their their fears and their insecurities about changes that possibly could take place and are taking place in American culture. And, and really, people who have not lived in, outside of their home culture, they have no frame of reference. Why should the average American know anything about how people live in an African village? Any more than an African villager should know anything about how the average American lives in suburban America. And I realized at some point that if I had never left the United States, if I had never been given that opportunity, then I'd really be in the same boat as my fellow Americans. And the whole thing about being so focused on your own culture to the exclusion that you're not interested in what happens elsewhere, I, I saw that attitude even in my own self, even after coming back from being overseas. I mean, you very quickly forget about how great the poverty is in the world, in, in many parts of the world, at least. And, you know, you see the, the great prosperity in the United States, and, and pretty soon it, it starts seeming normal that people have houses that are uh, 2,600 square foot with two and a half car garages built onto them. You start to compare your station in life with that of other people. You forget how small your Russian Lada was when you see somebody drive by in their Chevy Silverado. We don't choose which culture we're going to be born in. And we don't get to choose our parents, the people who are going to transfer their views to us. You know, during your lifetime, you can broaden your perspective, but you can't change the place from where you're viewing the scenery. No one's culture is perfect. I mean, culture is an expression of how groups of people think, speak, behave. But it's still an expression of, of human beings, and, and no people are perfect. You know, that's true because of the fall into sin. We all have something to teach others, and we all have something that we can learn from other cultures. People participate in this exchange to varying degrees. Some people are very interested in trying as many different ethnic foods and experiencing as many different 
ethnic cultural events as they can and other people, it's not really their cup of tea. As Christians, we recognize that multiculturalism isn't the world's salvation. That's really a humanistic thought. Now, God sent his holy scriptures to a specific race and culture of people. He wrote the Bible in Hebrew language in the Old Testament. The laws in the Torah set up very strict cultural and social boundaries. Did that with the reason to lay a foundation to protect the people of all the nations of the world, to pick up people for himself that he could nurture, that he could discipline, that he could prepare to ultimately receive his son. God sent his one and only son to minister to that specific tribe of human beings with their specific cultural context. With only very few exceptions, Jesus preached to and healed Jewish people. He didn't travel around the world spreading his message from one continent to the next. But the salvation that Jesus won is for the people of every nation and every culture on earth, including his own people who rejected him. In America, you can share a falafel with your Muslim friend. You can go for a pad thai with your Vietnamese co-worker. You can attend the quinceañera of your neighbor's daughter, and you might do all three of those things in one weekend. And those are truly wonderful experiences. But if God uses you to help someone of another culture move out of the world of works, righteousness, and into the kingdom of his grace, then you've done something much bigger than just broadening your own cultural perspective. You've led another lost soul into the broad tent of God's love. The next time on Home Ties, America is the land of instant coffee, express checkouts, and easy banking. It's no surprise, really, that the rest of the world hasn't caught the bug for our addiction to speed. Factor in God's sense of timing, and it's a whole nother thing. We'll see you next time.